The start of Operation Barbarossa on the 22nd of June 1941 unleashed three German army groups onto the Soviet Union. Army Group North drove into the Baltic states towards its objective at Leningrad. Army Group Center smashed through Belarusia, aiming at Moscow, the Soviet capital. Army Group South was directed to seize the industrial and agricultural resources of the Ukraine, reaching as far east as Rostov-on-Don as a springboard for a further advance, threatening the oil fields of the Caucasus and perhaps even British possessions in the Middle East. By the middle of September, Army Group South, with its Hungarian and Romanian allies, was well over halfway to the Don, and 650,000 Soviet troops had been trapped at Kiev. However, two points of resistance had been left behind the German front line. The city of Odessa was still holding out on the Black Sea coast against a mainly Romanian besieging force. The Crimean Peninsula remained in Soviet hands, posing a serious problem for Army Group South headquarters. The Crimea had no economic importance for the Germans, but strategically, it was vital. From its base at Sevastopol, the Soviet fleet could dominate the Black Sea, and from airfields in the Crimea, the Soviet Air Force could attack the Romanian oil fields at Ploesti that were crucial for the German war machine. Hitler, in fact, called the Crimea a Soviet aircraft carrier in their attack on Romania's oil. Of more immediate concern to Field Marshal von Rundstedt, Commander-in-Chief of Army Group South, was the threat posed to his right flank as he prepared to renew his advance after the Soviet disaster at Kiev. He could hardly leave the Crimea as an assembly area for a counter-offensive into his lightly garrisoned rear areas. On the other hand, if the Germans could occupy the Crimea, they would not only remove the threat to Ploesti and limit the Black Sea Fleet's operations, but one of the gateways to the Caucasus would only be a short sea passage away, across the Kerch Straits. The advance from Rostov would involve a long approach march across the almost roadless wastes of the Kuban steppe between the Sea of Azov and the Caspian Sea. The early arrival of German troops in the foothills of the Caucasus might encourage anti-Soviet feeling among the local population and perhaps even prompt Turkey to join the Axis powers. Von Rundstedt assigned the mission of capturing the Crimea to his southernmost army, 11th Army. The army was also tasked to continue its advance towards Rostov. On the 12th of September, General of Infantry Erik von Manstein was appointed the new commander of 11th Army, and five days later, he arrived at its headquarters in Nikolaev. Von Manstein was the embodiment of the Prussian military tradition. He served as von Rundstedt's chief of staff in the invasion of Poland in 1939, and by 1941, his reputation within the German army was well established. At the start of Operation Barbarossa, Manstein was commanding 56th Panzer Corps in Army Group North, and although he'd never served with armored troops before, he soon proved his abilities with a run of successes. Manstein was quick to assess the difficulties in his task ahead. 
His orders emphasized the importance of capturing the Crimea quickly and getting a force across the Kerch Straits, but at the same time, he was instructed to provide the southern wing of Army Group South's march on Rostov. 11th Army was expected to attack southwards to penetrate a heavily defended bottleneck to the Crimea, probably followed by the siege of a fortified naval base. However, at the same time, it had to try to keep up with Army Group South's armoured spearhead, 1st Panzer Group, in its exploitation battles to the east. At first, these tasks looked to be beyond 11th Army's resources. Two corps, 30th Corps with two infantry divisions and the motorized Liebstandarte Adolf Hitler division, and 49th Mountain Corps with two mountain divisions and an infantry division, were approaching the line from Melitopol to Zaporozhye as they pursued the retreating Red Army eastwards. A third corps, the 54th, was preparing to attack the Crimea across the fortified Perikop Isthmus, with only two infantry divisions in place and another due to arrive after mopping up at Odessa and along the Black Sea coast. In addition, there was the Romanian 3rd Army that was affiliated to 11th Army, but not directly under Manstein's command. The general opinion amongst the Germans was that, having occupied Moldova, the Romanians had achieved their war aims and were in no hurry to take a fuller part in the war. Assessing his missions and the forces assigned to him, Manstein quickly decided that he could not give the same priority to both tasks. He decided to concentrate on the Crimea first, because an advance eastwards was too dangerous unless the Crimea was occupied and because of the importance the German high command put on reaching the Caucasus from Kirsch, he began to regroup his forces. The strategic geography of the Crimea shaped Manstein's plans. The peninsula is a rough diamond shape, nearly 200 miles across from eastern to western tips and 125 miles from north to south. A belt of lakes and marshes, known as the Sivash Sea, separates the Crimea from the mainland. It's 15 to 25 miles wide and a horrendous military obstacle. There are only two land routes onto the peninsula. The Perikop Isthmus in the west is roughly five miles wide and cut by an ancient fortification known as the Tartar Ditch that is up to 50 feet deep. In the east, a railway runs along the Chongar Peninsula that is so narrow in places that the sea lies on either side of the embankment. Most of the peninsula is open steppe, with almost no settlements or defence lines. But the southern third is occupied by the Yela Mountains. They shield the southern coasts from northerly winds in winter, protecting the Black Sea coast. In the southwest lies Sevastopol, the great naval base. There are some less important harbors, such as Yevpatoria in the east and Balaclava, Yalta and Feodosia in the south, that played minor roles in the campaign. Finally, the port of Kirsch gives its name to the peninsula that stretches eastwards and is separated by a narrow strait from the Taman Peninsula and the mainland north of the Caucasus. Although the Perikop Isthmus had been fortified in depth with two deep belts of defences, Manstein decided that he had no alternative but to fight a breakthrough battle there. The Isthmus could not be outflanked and the Germans had no amphibious resources for a landing operation. So Manstein reinforced 54th Corps with all the artillery and engineers he could find and ordered 50th Infantry Division to join the Corps for the final breakthrough. Realising that the breakthrough battle would almost exhaust 54th Corps, he pulled the German 49th Mountain Corps away from the battle in the steppes so that it could exploit the breakthrough and reach Kirsch, from where the High Command wished it to advance into the Caucasus. Manstein hoped to use the motorized Liebstandarte division to take Sevastopol by a surprise thrust. This left only the 30th Corps to maintain the pressure on the retreating Russians, 
but Manstein managed to persuade General Domiteshku, the commander of the 3rd Romanian Army, to move across the Dnieper River and join the eastwards pursuit. This added a cavalry corps and a mountain corps, each of three brigades, to the eastern push. But Manstein was still taking the conscious risk that the Russians would not stop their withdrawal and counterattack. Manstein would have liked to start the assault at Perikop on the 20th of September, but was forced to wait until the 24th. 11th Army had advanced over 300 miles since it crossed the Soviet border, and supply convoys were struggling to keep up over poor roads. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. On the Soviet side, the defense of the Crimea was entrusted to 51st Separate Army that had four infantry divisions, four militia divisions, and a cavalry group of three divisions under command, but these were mostly newly raised formations. The army commander, Colonel General Kuznetsov, did not really expect an attack on the Crimea. He deployed three of his infantry divisions under 9th Rifle Corps along the northern coast, with the 156th Rifle Division holding the Perikop Isthmus. Most of the militia divisions were dispersed to defend the coasts, and two operational groups were kept in the center of the peninsula to counter-attack against any German assault. About 30,000 men defended the north of the peninsula. 40,000 men were along the coasts, and 25,000 were held in the operational groups in the center. When the attack began, Manstein had three divisions in his front line. During the night of the 23rd and 24th of September, the 22nd Division launched diversionary attacks away from the Perikop Isthmus. Supported by all available aircraft and artillery, 54th Corps launched 45th and 73rd Infantry Divisions into the attack at 4.30 on the morning of September the 24th. They were bitterly resisted by the 156th Rifle Division and had to fight for every machine gun post and pillbox. Manstein had expected this and had ordered his troops to bypass Russian strongpoints as much as possible. Using these tactics, 73rd Division managed to advance about two miles on the western side of the Isthmus. But by the afternoon of the 24th of September, there was no sign of an early breakthrough. The grinding breakthrough battle continued for the next three days. Every battalion commander in 156th Rifle Division was killed as they tried to stiffen the defense by their personal example. The deputy commander of 51st Army, General Batov, led an operational group formed from two rifle and one cavalry divisions that began to move from the central part of the peninsula on the 25th of September to join the battle at Perikop. But the group had to march over 60 miles under constant air attack, delaying its advance. The Luftwaffe's total air superiority also helped the German infantry to deal with the defenses at Perikop. Just before dawn on the 26th of September, 73rd Infantry Division began its attack on the Tatar Ditch. After a concentrated artillery barrage, the infantry and assault pioneers slid into the ditch and struggled up the far slope. Gradually, a foothold was achieved and during the following night, both divisions worked their way towards Amiansk at the back of the first belt of defences that was ten miles deep. But Batov's counter-attacking forces drove the Germans out in a charge delivered just before first light. The battle for territory continued back and forth for another couple of days before the German advance finally halted. But it was not the Soviet resistance in the Crimea, however desperate, that prevented a complete breakthrough. Events on the steppe further north 
forced Manstein to change his plans completely. Despite its immense losses in the first three months of the war, the Red Army had managed to find new reserves. Two armies, the 9th and the 18th, had been reformed and held a defensive line running west of Melitopol, northwards to the Dnieper Bend near Zaporozhye. From the 22nd of September, they began to launch minor attacks that were checked without causing 11th Army much concern, although they began to wear down the resistance of the Romanian units sandwiched between the German divisions on this sector of the front. Eventually, these attacks increased in scale until more than 10 infantry divisions, with at least one armor brigade, started probing the gaps between German and Romanian formations. On the morning of the 27th of September, the tide began to turn. The 2nd and 4th Romanian mountain brigades began to weaken in the face of attacks led by tanks that their anti-tank weapons could not stop. German units were also coming under pressure. The 22nd Infantry Division between the Sivash and Melotopol had been reduced to the combat strength of a small regiment and its commander was starting to talk of withdrawal. Wasting no time, Manstein reacted quickly. First, he ordered that there was to be no withdrawal. Second, he checked the forces moving to complete the breakthrough into the Crimea. 49th Mountain Corps and the Liebstandarte SS Adolf Hitler Division were turned back, and Manstein moved his tactical headquarters to the northeast in order to make his presence felt among the wavering Romanian staffs. On the 29th of September, 49th Mountain Corps began a counterattack in support of the 3rd Romanian Army, and the northern arm of the Soviet counterattack was confirmed. The Liebstandarte was about to follow up this attack when a Romanian cavalry brigade gave way in the center. Manstein was on hand to prevent this and swing the Liebstandarte division to oppose the threatened breakthrough on the 1st of October. Things were looking brighter for the Germans. The battle began to turn in their favor. Besides taking his own measures to check the Soviet advance, Manstein had been urging army groups south to organize a major counterstroke. The Soviet 9th and 18th armies were now fully engaged in the battle against 11th Army, leaving their northern flank vulnerable to a blow from General von Keist's 1st Panzer Army. Army Group South quickly seized the opportunity, and 1st Panzer Army began to cross the Dnieper at the Zaporozhye and Dniprovitrosk bridgeheads on the 1st of October. By the next morning, reports were reaching Manstein that the Russians were beginning to withdraw to the east. By the 3rd of October, 11th Army was able to order its eastern grouping to pursue the disappearing enemy. On the 6th, Melotipol was captured and 49th Mountain Corps linked up with von Kleist's panzers. By the end of the battle, over 100,000 prisoners had been captured and the 9th and 18th armies were ruined. The 11th army took 27,000 prisoners, 130 guns and 64 tanks. In Manstein's view, the Russians had missed a great opportunity. Their forces were so superior to 11th army at the start of the operation that if they had been better led, they could have destroyed the German position south of the Dnieper. As it was, the road to Rostov was laid open for army group south. By now, Hitler had agreed that 11th Army could not fight a battle on two increasingly separated fronts and gave orders for Manstein to concentrate on the Crimea. But he was also told to hand over 49th Mountain Corps and the Liebstandarte Division to von Kleist's 1st Panzer Army for the advance to Rostov. This left Manstein with 30th and 54th Corps a total of six infantry divisions, most of which had been heavily engaged in the earlier battles. The third Romanian army was to take over coastal defense on the Black Sea and Sea of Azov. 42nd Corps, with two infantry divisions, was sent to the Crimea, although one division had to be diverted elsewhere before it arrived. 
Einstein was lumbered with a rather old-fashioned army, an infantry-artillery hybrid with no tanks under command and still heavily dependent on horse transport. He was determined that 11th Army should have a mobile force that could exploit a breakthrough when it was achieved. So Group Ziegler was improvised from Romanian motorized infantry units and more mobile German elements. This was better than nothing, but it was a long way from the Panzer divisions leading the terrifying German Blitzkrieg. While 11th Army's attack was stalled, the Russians had been strengthening the Crimea's defenses. South of Perikop, two small lakes split the isthmus into three narrow strips of land, two of which joined at the village of Ishun. This was the last good defensive position in the north of the peninsula. If it was lost, the Russians would be forced back to the southern mountains and the defenses of Sevastopol and Kirsch. They were determined to hold the Ishun position at all costs. In the first weeks of October, concrete pillboxes, minefields and anti-tank ditches were added to the defences up to 10 miles deep. The immediate defence of Ishun was assigned to General Batov's operational group of four small divisions. 51st Army's commander, General Kuznetsov, continued to hold more forces along the northern coast and in the centre of the peninsula, but they couldn't influence the decisive battle. Shortly after the German attack began, Kuznetsov was relieved of his command and replaced by the more determined Batov. In Moscow, Stalin had also come to realize that the defense of Odessa, however heroic, was a waste of troops. The garrison would be better used to fight Germans in the vital Crimea than the mostly Romanian force attacking Odessa. The evacuation was completed on the night of the 16th of October and 86,000 troops, 500 guns and 20,000 tons of ammunition, plus tanks and vehicles, were landed in Sevastopol and Yevpatoria by the Black Sea's fleet. They were formed into the coastal army under General Petrov and began to assemble near Simferopol. All its divisions were under strength and short of equipment, but they were soon drawn into the struggle at Ishun. Manstein had no choice but to fight another attritional battle in horrendous conditions. With no feasible way to bypass the Soviet defenses, surprise and maneuver were impossible. At the start of the operation, Manstein could only deploy the 54th Corps and three divisions on the narrow strips of ground around Eshun, so the attackers didn't outnumber the defenders. Manstein could rely on his artillery, but this advantage was offset by the Soviet superiority in the air. Whereas 11th Army had benefited from the support of the Luftwaffe's 4th Air Corps in the earlier battle at Perikop, the Corps had now been ordered to support 1st Panzer Army as well. At this stage in the war, the German Army was not used to operating without the Luftwaffe's support, and the lack of air cover began to sap the soldiers' morale. The offensive began on the 18th of October. On the first day, 54th Corps only managed to penetrate the Soviet outpost line. Meanwhile, 11th Army's war diary noted the Russians' extraordinary infantry resistance, strongly built up positions, extensive minefields, intense artillery bombardments, and air resistance. In fact, a 10-day battle had begun that would test Manstein's qualities as a general to their limits. Visiting the front every day, he could see for himself the alarming way in which the combat power of his divisions was wasting away. Officer casualties were dangerously high, and staff officers had to be turned into frontline commanders. 
From the 22nd of October, the rain turned a dire situation into a living hell. Roads turned to mud and supplies ran desperately short. Ammunition shortages threatened to stop some divisions. Manstein rose to the challenge. Although he couldn't avoid sending his troops into frontal attacks, he did ensure that these were always properly coordinated with the artillery and, when available, air support. He kept pressing his superiors to provide more air support until Goering sent reinforcements to 4th Air Corps. Fighters under Colonel Mulders, the first ace to be awarded the Knight's Cross with oak leaves and swords and diamonds after his 100th victory in July 1941, was sent to hold the Soviet Air Force at bay while ground attack aircraft began to pound the Russian frontline positions. When the crisis struck after a week of slow grinding progress, Manstein had to judge whether his troops could continue and if the Soviet defense was about to break. On the 27th of October, 54th Corps broke through the centre of the defensive belt and Group Ziegler was able to pass through and begin its dash to block the road to Sevastopol. The next day, the Russians began to withdraw, with the 51st Army retreating southeast towards Kirsch, while the coastal army pulled back to Simferopol, covering the main road to Sevastopol. The nature of the battle changed immediately. Manstein had to ask his weary troops to pursue and, if possible, cut off the retreating Soviet forces. He hoped to seize Sevastopol in the rush and to prevent 51st Army's escape from Kirsch. The German troops responded instinctively, capturing thousands of Soviet troops. But in the worsening weather, and with a very small mobile force, it was impossible to prevent significant numbers of Russians from escaping. Forty Second Corps reached the outskirts of Kirsch on the 6th of November, but the port was only secured ten days later, by which time about 40,000 Soviet troops had escaped by sea. Simferopol and the Yela Mountains were rapidly secured by 30th Corps, although some Russian troops escaped to operate as partisans from caves and other hideouts. However, as 54th Corps approached Sevastopol, it met stiffening resistance and even some counterattacks. In the end, the plan to capture Sevastopol from the march had to be abandoned, and 11th Army began to plan an early assault on the fortifications. But as the notorious Russian winter began to bite, problems started multiplying. Logistics were hit the hardest. In the Crimea, with its milder climate, continuing rain was the biggest problem. Most roads were unusable. But further north, the Ukraine was in the grip of ice and snow. South of the Dnieper River, only one railway engine was working, and 11th Army needed more than three trainloads of supplies each day to stockpile the ammunition for an assault on Sevastopol. Manstein had originally hoped to begin the attack on the 27th of November, but it was actually the 17th of December before the preparations were complete. Meanwhile, the Russians worked frantically to improve their defences. On the 7th of November, Stavka, the Soviet Supreme Headquarters in Moscow, established the Sevastopol defensive region that was ordered to defend the besieged city to the last man. Vice Admiral Oktyabirsky, commander of the Black Sea's fleet, was put in charge of the defensive region, and Major General Petrov, commander of the Coastal Army, was made his deputy for land forces. 
Oktyabirsky had been working to improve the defences since the summer, and by December, Sevastopol had become one of the most strongly fortified places in the world. Three defence lines covered the base. The forward line was 27 miles long and 10 miles from the centre of Sevastopol. About three miles behind that was the main line, which was 23 miles long, running from the river Katya in the north to Balaclava, south of Sevastopol. Finally, there was the rear line, which was 18 miles long and backed by an anti-tank ditch covered by artillery and machine guns. Modern coastal defences batteries, armoured turrets on concrete emplacements with 44 guns of up to 12 inches in calibre could cover the land approaches as well as the sea and were reinforced by newly constructed positions using guns from damaged warships. The Sevastopol fortress contained 82 coastal and field artillery positions, 20 miles of anti-tank ditch, 35 miles of barbed wire entanglements, and nearly 10,000 anti-tank and anti-personnel mines. Petrov's coastal army had four rifle divisions that were each allocated a sector of the defences. There were also a number of naval infantry brigades and battalions, some of which had been raised from sailors in the naval base. The bulk of the Black Sea's fleet was withdrawn to Novorossiysk at the beginning of November, leaving two cruisers, three destroyers and some small craft in the harbour. But the old battleship Sevastopol and a number of cruisers made a series of trips back to Sevastopol to bombard German positions. Destroyers and other small ships were responsible for resupplying Sevastopol, using darkness and bad weather to dodge German air attacks. Manstein was once again about to commit his troops to head-on attacks against strong defensive positions with inadequate resources, something far removed from the wide-ranging battles of manoeuvre for which he is famous. Yet again, he had no alternative. It would be impossible to launch a force across the Kirch Straits while Sevastopol held out in his rear. In planning the attack, Manstein decided that there were two possible lines of approach, from north or south. The hilly, wooded terrain in the centre made an attack from the east too difficult. The defences were weaker in the south, but the poor roads made it impossible for the Germans to assemble and supply a strong enough assault force from the Balaclava direction. The northern route was more practicable and led to the hills that commanded Severnaya Bay, the main anchorage. Manstein's resources were totally inadequate for an assault on a large fortified area. By early November, his army consisted of three German corps headquarters with eight infantry divisions under their command and the Romanian Mountain Corps. Only two of the infantry divisions were reasonably fresh and approaching full strength. One division, 72nd Infantry, had been so mauled in the earlier fighting that its companies numbered from only 12 to 61 men. 11th Army was a quarter under strength, with the largest shortages among the infantry who would have to lead the attack. Concentrating enough power to shatter the Sevastopol defences would mean taking a huge risk. Manstein allocated 42nd Corps headquarters to defend the coast against Soviet landings, but he allowed it only one German division and a Romanian brigade. They were concentrated in the Kirsch Peninsula, where the threat of a landing seemed greatest. This left seven divisions around Sevastopol. The main northern attack was to be delivered by 54th Corps, with four divisions that were to concentrate on pushing down the Belbeck River Valley and seizing the Mackenzie Heights that overlook Sevenaya Bay. A supporting attack by 30th Corps with two German divisions and the Romanian Mountain Corps would then advance from the southeast on the axis of the Chennaya River Valley. Meanwhile, the 50th Division was to attack from the east to link the two attacks and capture the commanding ground at Memorial Heights. But Manstein's plans would not remain intact for long. 
Manstein's tactics were once again upset by Soviet actions away from the Crimea. The 1st Panzer Army had reached Rostov, but the Red Army launched a counter-offensive into Army Group South's overextended northern flank on the 17th of November. In late November, von Rundstedt decided to order the 1st Panzer Army to withdraw from Rostov. But this order was countermanded by Hitler, who sacked von Rundstedt on the 1st of December. Because of the crisis at Rostov, Army Group South wanted to take two of Manstein's divisions from the Crimea. He protested, but could not prevent the loss of 73rd Division. This was the only division that was not committed in the line around Sevastopol or at Kirsch because it was earmarked as 54th Corps reserve to complete the breakthrough to the heights north of Sevenaya Bay. Despite the risk, Manstein had little choice but to press ahead with the assault. The attack was timed to start at 10 past six on the morning of the 17th of December. There was no preliminary artillery bombardment in the hope of winning an element of surprise. Instead, the artillery were to concentrate on the strong points in the Soviet line, trying to break the defenders' morale and help the assault infantry infiltrate as deeply as possible, cutting lines of retreat. On the first day, the furthest advance was achieved by the 22nd Division, which managed to press up to five kilometers down the Belbeck Valley. But the other divisions were held up by the rugged terrain and determined Soviet resistance. The Germans continued to make slow progress until the 23rd of December, when the 22nd Division seized crucial ground north of the Belbeck River and forced the Russians to withdraw their remaining forces in the northern sector. Both sides were rapidly using up their reserves. On the 20th of December, Stavka transferred the Sevastopol defensive region to the Transcaucasus Front, which was ordered to send reinforcements to the city. A rifle division and a naval infantry brigade were landed in Sevastopol a day later. But Manstein could get no reinforcements. 22nd Division kept moving forward, but the spearhead of its advance was getting smaller every day. On the 26th of December, its leading regiment almost reached Fort Stalin, one of the two great artillery batteries overlooking Sevenaya Bay. But the division was on the verge of collapse. A reserve division could have completed the breakthrough, but Manstein had no reserves. If anything, the first assault on Sevastopol was about to fail, because early on the 26th of December, the Russians began to land troops on the Kirch Peninsula. Even as he started to move forces away from Sevastopol to meet this threat, Manstein ordered one more attack by the gallant 22nd Division, but Fort Stalin held out. Manstein was forced not only to call off the attack on the 30th of December, but also to order the division to pull back to a less exposed position on the northern side of the Belbeck Valley. Five months would pass before he could turn his attention back to Sevastopol. The Kirch landings were not a small diversion, but part of the strategic counter-offensive that Stalin had ordered along the whole Eastern Front in December 1941. The Transcaucasus Front, with the Black Sea Fleet and the Azov Flotilla, were in the process of landing over 40,000 men in Crimea. The original Soviet plan was to land 20,000 men of the 51st Army on either side of Kirch, at the eastern end of the peninsula. Meanwhile, 44th Army, with 22,000 men, would land at Feodosia in the west and move north and cut the peninsula at its narrowest point at Parpach. However, bad weather and the need to send reinforcements into Sevastopol made it impossible to launch the attacks together. 51st Army was only able to land about 3,000 men on the 26th of December. And because of the winds and rough seas, it took five days to get 20,000 men ashore in a number of small and isolated beachheads. Thank you. 
46th Infantry Division, the German garrison in the Kirsch Peninsula, was beginning to deal with the beachheads in turn when 44th Army started to land at Feodosia on the morning of the 29th of December. The only German troops present were an engineer battalion that had been billeted in the town for the night. As wave upon wave of Russian troops came ashore, the German battalion was soon pushed inland. The defence of the Kirsch sector was the responsibility of 42nd Corps, under Lieutenant General Graf von Sponeck. Alarmed by the landings at Feodosia, he ordered 46th Division to pull out of the Kirsch Peninsula before it was cut off. Manstein countermanded the order, but von Sponeck's headquarters was already moving back and radio contact had been broken. 46th Division got clear, but lost most of its transport and heavy equipment in the process, so that when Manstein ordered it to turn about and attack, the division could only manage a show of obedience. Manstein relieved von Sponeck of command, but Hitler insisted on a court-martial. The court, chaired by Goering, sentenced von Sponeck to death. In fact, the situation at Kirsch and Feodosia was not as serious as Manstein had feared, largely because the two Soviet armies failed to exploit the opportunities in front of them. Both concentrated on securing the perimeters around their beachheads and made little attempt to expand them. As a result, Manstein was given time to move troops from Sevastopol, although his redeployment was delayed on the night of the 4th and 5th of January when the Russians landed troops at Yevpatoria on the west coast, north of Sevastopol. This was a daring blow, accompanied by a parachute landing and an uprising of partisans in the town. However, 11th Army improvised a battle group around 105th Infantry Regiment with some artillery, engineers and Luftwaffe ground troops. Yevpatoria was recaptured after three days of fighting. Then a thaw struck, turning the roads back into mud tracks and slowing the eastward move of 30th Corps. By the 14th of January, Manstein had managed to assemble three German divisions, plus a Romanian division and two Romanian brigades for an attack on the Feodosia beachhead. The 44th Army had four divisions in the beachhead and there were at least four more nearby in Kirsch. The Russians had had over two weeks to prepare their defenses and if the German attack failed, they might have been left too weak to hold their positions in the eastern Crimea. Nevertheless, Manstein decided to go ahead rather than allow the Russians to bring in more reinforcements. He had obviously come to a low opinion of the opposing Soviet generals, whose defensive mentality suggested that they and their troops were afraid of the German army. On the 15th of January, the attack began. It took four days to drive the Russians out of Feodosia. Around 17,000 Soviet troops were killed or captured, but Manstein was disappointed that a large number escaped to the east. He began to prepare to follow up the capture of Feodosia by clearing the Kirsch Peninsula. Army Group South promised him more air support and Panzerabteilung, or tank detachment, with 60 to 75 tanks newly arrived from Germany. This was the first German tank unit to arrive in the Crimea, and the attack was set for dawn on the 26th of January. Then on the 24th, Army Group South called the tanks away to deal with a greater threat in the north. Manstein cancelled the attack immediately and shifted his army to wait on the defensive until the weather improved. The Russians, however, were not yet ready to abandon their hopes of driving 11th Army out of the Crimea. With the Kirsch Straits frozen over, it was possible to bring tanks and vehicles as well as men across from the Taman Peninsula. Unfortunately, the weather was not reliable and a series of thaws slowed the build-up of Soviet forces. 
Even so, by the beginning of February, the Soviet forces in the Crimea, now known as the Crimean Front, consisted of four armies. The Coastal Army in Sevastopol and the 44th, 47th and 51st in the Kirsch Peninsula. Together they commanded 17 rifle divisions, four mountain divisions, three cavalry divisions and a large number of independent brigades and regiments. They were backed by five tank brigades and some smaller tank units. By comparison, 11th Army had only seven German infantry divisions and two Romanian divisions, plus two Romanian mountain brigades and a cavalry brigade. The Germans still had no tanks. A Soviet attack was clearly imminent. In fact, Stalin was so impatient that he sent Lev Meklis, the chief commissar of the Red Army, to hurry the preparations. Meklis had taken a leading role in Stalin's purge of the officer corps. No general would dare delay an attack, however ill-prepared, if Meklis was at his side. The Soviet offensive was ordered for the 27th of February. German intelligence knew the date and even dropped leaflets over the Russian front line announcing this. Despite this, Meklis refused to delay and the Russians attacked as predicted. They were most successful in the north, where 18th Romanian Division was driven back for five miles. At the same time, the coastal army began a series of attacks from the Sevastopol perimeter. Although at least 35 attacks were launched by the coastal army in a week, they were successfully checked by 54th Corps, and Manstein was even able to move another regiment across to Parpach. The fighting on the Parpak sector continued until the 3rd of March, when the Russian attacks were halted, officially because the ground was too soft for the tanks and resupply had become too difficult. But in reality, the Russian tanks were not being used effectively. Middle-ranking and senior officers did not yet have the skills and experience required to coordinate tank and infantry units. However, the weight of Soviet armor opposing 11th Army did convince the German high command that the newly raised 22nd Panzer Division with the mobile 28th Light Division should be sent to the Crimea. The ground began to freeze again on the 8th of March, allowing the Russians to build up their supplies and prepare to renew their offensive. They began on the 13th of March, attacking over the whole front but concentrating their main effort in the north. Even though the Germans estimated that they had destroyed 200 tanks by the 19th of March, they could not halt the growing salient in the north. Manstein obtained permission to use the 22nd Panzer Division, even though it was still arriving in the Crimea. On the 20th of March, the division attacked, accompanied by the 46th and 170th Infantry Divisions. It ran into a Russian assembly area, and the attack backfired. Operating with the corps headquarters and flanking divisions that it had never trained with, 22nd Panzer had an uncomfortable baptism of fire. But Manstein felt that the arrival of German tanks would severely limit Soviet operations. New offensives were launched on the 26th of March and the 9th of April, but both were rebuffed after a few days. By the middle of April, both sides were locked into a grinding stalemate. Neither side had the power to launch an attack, but the initiative was shifting towards 11th Army. Manstein opted to begin the summer campaign with an attack at Kirsch, choosing to destroy the stronger Soviet grouping first. His staff began to plan Operation Bustard Hunt. <laughs> 